emotions and personality. There's so much to the person of the Holy Spirit. He's not an it. He's a person. We don't know what he exactly looks like, per se. But there's so much to that, to the depth of his personality, his emotions, his thoughts, the way he does things. That's what we're talking about today. Well, hello, good morning, good evening, and good night, good afternoon. I'm trying it again. It's not really working. Ay, ay, ay. As promised, I start out with a yawn. No, as promised, we are talking about Holy Spirit today. Um, I've been reading a lot about Holy Spirit, and um, it's just been impacting me a lot, and so. It was just something that I really wanted to talk about. So I put a few things together so that we could chit chat about it. And I, I, I mean, I've been reading a book called Good Morning Holy Spirit by Benny Hinn. And if you've read it already, you'll probably already know a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about. But it's still fun to like hear different perspectives on it so if you have a different perspective and or comment or anything ever please um you know dm me on instagram georgia in the usa or on twitter georgia d come talk with me or georgia d podcast or whatever um yeah please leave a review follow blah 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 all the things But I'm excited about this week's podcast because last week was a wee bit sad, not going to lie. And GL, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit sorry, but at the same time, we need to be praying for this situation and for these women and for these people to be converted to know Jesus and um, this industry to be stopped. So. Um, but anyways, this week's podcast, Holy Spirit, a much better topic. I feel like I've been falling in love with Holy Spirit as a person. I just feel like he's here right now. Like, I just want to invite him into this room, into your room. Yeah, Holy Spirit, we just welcome you into this place, into... I, whoever's my friend that's listening's podcast like into their room and that you would just be with us as we listen and as we talk about you and as we worship you through this podcast so like I was saying I've just been falling in love with him um, while reading this book and I highly recommend it whether you know Holy Spirit or not if you feel like you don't really know him or you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit I mean this book would be perfect for you but if you also know him this book is also perfect for you because it opens up even if you already have an open, like a relationship with Holy Spirit on a daily basis, this just adds to it. It just adds more. It tells you a little bit more about him. Maybe things that you didn't know about him. It will, it talks about that too. So anyways, it's amazing. So let's just begin. Um, One of the first points I wanted to talk about him is that like well, I once heard somebody say that they prefer to address him as Holy Spirit just like you say Lord like God the Father or like God you know you, you don't say the God you say God you don't say the Jesus you say Jesus 
right? So why do we say the Holy Spirit? Why don't we just say Holy Spirit? You know what I mean? You're addressing him as a person because he is a person. You know what I mean? Just as much as God is a person, just as much as Jesus is a person. They are they are a person. They're a being. They're a spirit. So, so I feel like I just like it better when we, when I, when people address Holy Spirit as Holy Spirit, not the Holy Spirit, because he's not a something. He's a person. You don't address your friend as the Shelby or the Candace. It's like, no, Candace and Shelby. You know what I mean? So that, um, to get your brain beginning to start thinking, um, he's as much God as the other two. Now, maybe right away you're like, duh, yeah, no, of course he is. But think about the way that you address the Lord, God the Father, and the way that you address Jesus. Do you address Holy Spirit at a lesser capacity than God the Father or Jesus? I think a lot of times, and I I think even myself, even having a relationship with Holy Spirit prior to reading this book, I think I kind of, uh, there, there isn't, like, Holy Spirit's job is to make, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, I'm going to go into his job or what he does, but part of what he does is to make the Lord's presence palatable for us because if the Lord steps into the room you're going to be filled with the fear of God you're going to be as if dead like John you know what I mean and so I guess that was Jesus but still like the presence of the Lord is like not palatable for our human bodies that's why we when we go to heaven we get a new body You know, because our bodies will be able to stand, withstand his presence and be in his presence for the rest of eternity, right? So, so sometimes knowing that Holy Spirit's in the room, but it's not, it's a small, sometimes it's a small, subtle presence, but you can still feel the weightiness in the room. But that's also why we need to grow in understanding of sensing his presence, number one, but also sensing his leading, if that makes sense. Like if you're speaking, maybe he wants to do this. Maybe he wants people to stop. Maybe he wants people to worship, to clap, to jump, to run, to do something strange to forgive one another, whatever it is, whatever his leading is, it might be a small little hand on your shoulder or a little nudge or a little, maybe let's do this or a whisper. And so his presence may be light. It may be very powerful as well. Um, if you've ever been through like a fire tunnel or like a group of, excuse me, um, people, that are laying on of hands and then you like pass out under the spirit because it's so powerful or like slain in the spirit. Like the, the, his encounter can feel like electricity, like plugged into the wall. I mean, I'm going to get into these. It can be intense, but oftentimes Holy Spirit is, is making the Lord's presence palatable for you. But I think... A lot of times because it might be a more subtle touch, it might be a little not as what we would so call powerful, even though his small touch, just knowing he's with you, knowing that God, Holy Spirit is God, he's in the room and he wants to be with you is incredibly, incredibly powerful and moving itself because why would God the three in one right I'm gonna explain this more later but they they have their own thoughts but 
they also, Holy Spirit speaks. He doesn't do or say what the other ones won't say or do. So, like when Jesus was here, he said that the Father's in him and he's in the Father. And he doesn't do anything that the Father doesn't say or do, right? So when Jesus left, Holy Spirit came and does the same thing. But he's not in the flesh, he's in the Spirit, right? And he's in us. And so, Holy Spirit has his own mind and his own thoughts but also he's like an amplifier for God, if that makes sense. He does what he wants, but he also does what the Father wants, if that makes sense. He doesn't do anything outside of what the Father or Jesus would do. So, Holy Spirit deserves as much glory and as much worship and adoration as the Father and as the Son, because He is as much part of the Trinity as the other two. They are all God. They are all one and they are all three and they are all to be worshiped and all to be magnified and glorified because they are all God, if that makes sense. I'm going to get into it a little bit more, but Okay, well, I can just explain it. Um, it's kind of, It can be explained like this. If I were to tell you to turn on the light, I, I'm in the place of like the, com- the person telling what to do, which is in the place of God, right? The commander, turn on the light. The person turning on the light would be Jesus. He's turning on the light, right? He's the one going to do it. And the power, the actual light, even like the person that's turning on the light isn't actually, you can't actually turn on the light without power. You're not actually making it go on. The power makes it go on. If you don't have power in the house or you didn't pay an electric bill, even if you flip on the switch, it's not going to happen. Uh Uh-oh, my battery's dead for my monitor. Um, so you need, and Holy Spirit would be the power. So when you turn the switch on, the power comes on. That's Holy Spirit. He is the manifest power of God. Another example would be the sun. There's a lot of things happening to make the sun the sun. You have the sun itself that you can see. And then there's the light of the sun that you can see, right? But then the heat, you can't see the heat necessarily, but you can feel it. So it's in in the same way a lot of times you feel Holy Spirit, you sense Holy Spirit. Um, yeah, I hope that makes sense, but they're all three in one, but they have their own roles within that one person being one in three. Yeah, I think it's so interesting and so powerful. Okay, to grieve him, this is the worst. I mean, I think a lot of people don't understand what it means to grieve him. Um, so I'm going to talk about it. Another example is wind, like Holy Spirit, wind can't be stopped, but a person can be resisted and Holy Spirit is a person. Um, That's just a random thing I wanted to say because we can't see him all the time. Maybe you can in the spirit, 
but um or maybe you can in a different supernatural way see him i know people that do um the lord has shared an ability for me to be able to see him as well um when he's there and um it's available for anyone so you just have to ask him um to grief and to grieve in the greek the root word means lupa meaning to feel pain in body and mind to suffer mental and physical anguish he can be vexed tormented he will leave your presence with a wounded heart when you grieve him. Grieving him could be gossip, any type of sin, any type of um, thing that makes him um, sad, vexed, tormented. When I heard that tormented, like you can, people actually torment Holy Spirit. I think that just like shook me. I was like, what? No, I never ever want to torment holy spirit like i don't want to be the reason for any mental suffering or physical anguish that he may feel he will gently retreat and leave with a wounded heart if he is quenched he will quietly depart why would people want to vex or quiet such a lovely person um in the book um, Benny Hinn talks about Catherine Kuhlman and a met and a, at a, a meeting he was at when she was uh, speaking and she in the meeting she was sobbing crying at one point and she was like screaming and yelling and pointing at people don't grieve him don't grieve he's my best friend he's the only thing I've got please don't grieve him and she's crying and she's like please don't grieve him He's the only thing I have. And and when I was reading that, I actually started to cry in a big way because because when you're reading it, it's like oh my gosh. He's so amazing and he's so sweet and so good. Why would I ever let myself grieve him? Ever. How can I be so hard, hardened, or self-centered to grieve him? I cannot. I cannot. Who keeps us safe while you sleep at night, while you're out and about throughout your day, while you're interacting with people you don't really know, strangers at the store, you don't know what their motive is. Hopefully, you know, love hopes the best, but sometimes people don't have the best motives. And, and while you're sleeping, people can do weird stuff and try to come and do bad things at night, you know. So, who is keeping you safe through all of that? The answer is Holy Spirit. It's Holy Spirit, man. It's crazy. He keeps us safe through so much. Every single night we pray that he would we just plead the blood over our minds and that Holy Spirit has our night season. He is in charge of our night season. The demonic is not in charge of our night season. He doesn't give, get to give us bad dreams. He doesn't get to be in the room and cause fear or anger or frustration or anxiety. He doesn't get to be in the house. We pray like this. And I try to not make it a formula, but I feel like this is something I need to be praying because Everest has woken up in the middle of the night screeching and screaming and having bad dreams as in an infant, a newborn, all the way up. And so it's rare when it happens, but the nights that 
I forgot to pray, those are the nights that he's woken up. But every night I pray and plead the blood over his mind and all of our minds that the Lord would stand and watch over us as we sleep. And um, no spirit is allowed in our house except the Holy Spirit. He's the only spirit that's allowed in the house. And besides our own spirits and the Holy Spirit, no other spirit or demonic entity is allowed in our home. And I do ask that he would stand watch around our house and around our cars, around our property, protecting and watching, that he would stand watch over every natural and supernatural entrance into our house, that nothing can come in that is not from heaven. And so, yes. And, um, so I do pray this every night because I believe that it's important. Um, I once heard a pastor say that you begin your next day when you go to sleep. Like your day begins when you go to sleep. It's already starting because when you have a dream, the Lord is talking potentially about the next day and it's an option. Like, so a lot of times he wants to talk to us and help us throughout our next day. So your night season starts that process. So I don't want my night season being run, run by the devil. I don't want to be waking up in fear and anxiety and frustration and all these things. I want to wake up feeling excited and invigorated in love with Jesus more than I was the day before. And when Jesus is in charge, when Holy Spirit's in charge of your night season, um, you don't have anything to worry about. He's in charge. Give him surrender and give your night season to the Lord. Holy Spirit. Next, Jesus says, follow me. But then he says, don't follow me. You can come. You can't come where I'm going. But he is coming. And another is coming. And so this is so interesting to me because he's the whole time he's alive. He says, follow me, follow me, follow me. But then right before it's time for him to be crucified, he says, you can't follow me. And then the disciples are confused. Why, why can't I follow you? Why, why, why can't we go where you're going? You can't come. He says, you can't come where I'm going. Um, but another is coming. And he's obviously, well, I don't know, obviously, but he is talking about Holy Spirit coming um, at the day of Pentecost. And so, he says this, don't follow me, because yes, we do all things in Christ's name, and we he is the reason we have Holy Spirit, he's the reason we... Like, he is who we need for all things, Christ. But the one who brings the power now is Holy Spirit and gives us the power to do all things in Christ's name because of what he did on the cross and died for our sins and rose again on the third day. Does this make sense? So now we're not supposed to, we're still following Jesus, of course, but we're, we're supposed to be led by Holy Spirit. Now we follow Holy Spirit. We also follow Jesus because Holy Spirit doesn't do anything that the Father isn't doing, just like Jesus isn't. They're all one, but they also have individual minds. Holy Spirit has his own mind and his own will, his own emotions, um, but he also equally perfectly lines up with the Holy Spirit. I mean, with God the Father and God the Son. So, so we follow our guide now that Jesus is, is past is Holy Spirit. And we follow Him, if that makes sense. He's our guide. 
Um, this is something extra that I just felt was interesting during this time. Um, well, or during while I was reading this book, they talk about there are only like th like people always want to know how to hear God's voice, and Holy Spirit is God, you know, and so is Jesus. But God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, you know what I'm saying? But there are only three times when God the Father ever spoke. So a lot of times people are trying to hear God the Father, but it's not likely. It's more likely that you're going to hear Holy Spirit talk to you. I mean, that's that's a given. He wants to talk to you and he always, he will talk to you, especially in the still small voice that everyone always talks about. But there are only three times when God the Father ever spoke. So I want to go through a little bit of those. I want to say that because sometimes people want this big booming voice. And that is amazing when, when, if that happens. I want that to happen to me and to you, everybody. But more often than normal, I heard a pastor once say this. Someone that you're close to, like someone that you're far away to, like if I'm from me to, you know, across a bridge, you're going to yell and you have to lo be loud and you're far away from them. But someone that you're close to and you're comfortable with, you can whisper to because you're in close proximity. And that's what Holy Spirit wants. He wants to be intimate and close to you. That He only needs to whisper. And you'll hear him and obey. I am so sorry, but you know this comes with each podcast. Um, how did God speak to Moses through an angel? In the New Testament, there were only three times that God actually ever spoke. First, he spoke of Jesus. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You know this. You've heard this. Um... Yeah, then Jesus himself asked the Father to glorify your name. And here's what happened. Then a voice from heaven saying, that first one was from Matthew 3, and three um, chapter 3, verse 17. And the second one is in John 12, verse 28 and 29. And then Jesus asked the Father to glorify your name. And this, and here's what happened. Then a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd who heard it said it had thundered. I can't imagine the God's voice. It must be so powerful and so, like, all-encompassing. Like, you're feeling, like, the fear of God on probably a major level. So... The only other time God directly spoke was when the clouds surrounded the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. Matthew 17, 5. Again, the voice of God produced an awesome result. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their face and were greatly afraid. See, that's what I'm saying. They were afraid. I think that's the common trait with hearing God himself is that people are so afraid that they can't even move. And I think this is also why Holy Spirit is so key because again, God already knew that our bodies can't can can't handle hardly the voice can't handle the voice of God. So this is why we have Holy Spirit. But Jesus came. But Jesus came and touched them and said, "Arise and do not be afraid." When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Um, I think a lot of times in scripture, it says God spoke, but more than not if it's not saying Jesus and it's saying God spoke besides these three places 
These are the only three places where God the Father spoke. The rest of them are Holy Spirit throughout the entire Bible. Because Holy Spirit wrote the Bible, right? Through people. And where Jesus, it's not red letters, that's Jesus. Then the rest is Holy Spirit. He is the voice of God. In many cases, he's our main communication. Um, he brings desire. Um, you know, I want to tell you this story. I probably said it in another podcast before, but I, um, once heard this pastor talk to me or told me this story. He said, you know, I had this vision. He had a dream or a vision and in the vision, he was an infant brand new baby and in and the lord god was was holding him and he was in a brand new baby and god said to him love me and and the baby who was the man um in the dream was in the form of a brand new baby he tried he tried to love him but he couldn't he couldn't love god he tried and tried and god said again love me and he tried to love him but he couldn't so then he, god said it again a third time love me and he couldn't. He tried so hard. He like tried so hard to love him and he couldn't do it on, you know, he just couldn't do it. Then God said, you know, I love you. Sorry, I just stopped the podcast like super loud. My husband came home from work like so early and it freaked the crap out of me. Okay, I have to recollect my thoughts. So, like I was saying, God said love me to this man and he couldn't and the moment he said love I love you the man well the baby that was a man in real life but in the vision he loved he said I love you back to God and then he grew in the Lord's arms and then the Lord said I love you and then he was able to say I love you back and he grew again to a toddler. And then he said, I love you. God said, I love you. And then the boy said, I love you. And he grew and grew and the back and forth. The boy couldn't say, I love you, unless God first said, I love you first. It's like John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He loved us first. And it's astounding to me because I have gone through periods in my life where I love the Lord. I mean, I've always loved the Lord, but like where there's periods of time where I want to muster up something like I want to show my affection and love him deeply but when he doesn't bring desire when desire is lacking on my end it's not that God doesn't want us to desire him but he brings desire he brings the affection that we feel towards him and in a way, it keeps us poor in spirit. You know? Like, we can't love him unless he loves us. And it makes us so humble and hungry to know him, to be in his presence, to worship him. Because we can't do anything without him. We are incapable of breathing without him. And I know that sometimes it doesn't really feel like it heals or, or fixes the problem because we want to know him intimately and deeply immediately. And I'm not, I, I don't understand every season when we feel like we're lacking desire for the Lord. I think sometimes, yes, like, we can meet him and be intentional. 
That's the first step. But sometimes we go through phases where we, it's not that we don't love the Lord, but the, the world has our attention more than the Lord. And unfortunately, we desire what the world holds more than what he holds and who he is. But when we shut off the world to our minds and our hearts and our attentions and our eyes, he becomes, again, all that we've ever wanted. Because deep down, the things of the world, sometimes it's deep down, sometimes it's not deep down, sometimes it's so open and blatant. People always find that they're lacking, that they're depressed, that they're sad, that they're missing something, that they need more when they don't have the Lord. Always, and they always will, because it's written on their hearts, the law. It's written on their hearts who God is, because He made them. Whether they want to believe it or not, He created them. They, they are a spirit being from heaven, meant to go back to heaven. So, of course, you feel like you're missing something because the person that created you and loves you, you're, you don't know that. You don't know them. Which is an, a crazy thing. I think you can hear my stomach growling. That is so insane. I don't think I ate dinner. But it, it astounds me to think that God of the universe, all powerful, all, um, all, all way, all omnipotent, all powerful, all, you know, present, could create something, someone. And them have no idea who they are. And on the same token, they know that they need him. They know that they need something more. And hopefully the Lord reveals himself to them. All that to say, he brings desire. He brings your hunger. I don't know why he makes us hungrier in some seasons and less in others. I know there's a reason. There's always a reason. I know he teaches us in things in the desert wilderness seasons. I've also heard people say that there's no such thing as a wilderness season. There's a scripture for this. That, that, that he's a spring, a well that's bubbling over. That we're not meant to have dry seasons. I mean, and, and so... I want to lean towards we're not meant to have dry seasons because that would be amazing. And maybe we don't. We just feel like we do because we feel like we're feeling, we're trying to feel something and we feel like we're not feeling him. That makes sense. Where in other seasons, it's so prevalent. He's so there. He's so aware. Like you're so aware of his presence. You're so aware of who he is. And what he's doing in your life. And he's guiding you every step of the way. And, and there's confirmation after confirmation of things that he's doing in your life. And the people around you. And, and miracles, signs and wonders. And, and, and you're unstoppable in him. And, and then you'll turn around. And you'll be in this season where it feels as if he's miles away. And it's almost as if you feel like you did something wrong. What happened? I don't know. And, and that's not the Lord because he wants to be with you. I think I could be wrong. next his I wrote this now I'm 
His presence is everything. Well, way to follow that after desire. His presence literally is everything. Once you taste his presence and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it's everything you've been looking for. Peace, patience, goodness, all the fruits of the Spirit. It's bliss. It brings all your problems to a position where you can set it aside and not care. Because the the one that your heart and your soul longs for is in the room. And his attention's on you. And all you can do is worship him. And look at him. That's all you want to do. I can't imagine heaven. It's got to be. So special. So unique. John fell as if dead in God's presence. I think it's interesting, I've mentioned this already before, that God's presence is so magnificent that our bodies can't contain it. And the people that I know that have been in the presence of the Lord have been like as if like petrified. You know, they they, they are stunned. They're frozen. The fear of the Lord is so great that they can't move. They don't want to move. And so, Holy Spirit makes it palatable for us. And I I have mentioned this already. Holy Spirit makes His presence so subtle, so peaceful. And yet you can still understand the fear of the Lord with the Holy Spirit. With ever slow slight touches and nudges, whispers. Of love and compassion. Hmm. His presence makes life life his presence brings realignment his presence brings repentance his presence brings an openness a humbleness a hunger a desire for more for an endless supply of joy and peace throughout your day One day I was at work, I worked at a prayer center, best job ever, and um, very grateful for that job. Um, Anyways, I was at work, and you're praying for people all day long, and one day, We would see crazy miracles like tumors fall off and people that were had stutters could now talk or mute could now talk or blind or deaf or crazy, crazy things. Wild sicknesses be healed instantly. And and so um, I was sitting at work and I was just worshiping the Lord in between calls and All of a sudden, you know, I don't even know. I think I was talking to the Lord or journaling or something, but the presence of the Lord just came over me so strong while I was sitting up. And I, I, I was sitting in my chair. The presence of the Lord was so strong, so deeply strong. And I was 
stunned. A lot of times that had happened in my quiet place or in a, in a, in a group meeting, like a church meeting, you know, where the speaking was very powerful. But I was just sitting at work. It was so strong. I didn't care about anything else. I would pray for people and they would be healed immediately. I was in this other world full of bliss. I never want that to go away. I used to believe, and I still do believe, I believe that you can constantly live in the presence of the Lord. I want to feel the presence of the Lord at all times. That would be heaven on earth. His kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hmm. Okay. Think about the most powerful, omnipresent, omnip omnipotent God in all of creation coming to sit and to be with you. It's as if he's coming just to sit and look at you and love you. I know people say this all the time. When you have your kids and you just watch them sleep, your heart aches with love for them. And it does. Totally does. I'll watch ever asleep in the mornings. And I could lay there all morning and it's just the best. And I know the Lord does that with us. Um, life with Holy Spirit is an adventure. He makes what feels like, sometimes life feels very daunting, very mundane, very the same thing over and over again. But life with Holy Spirit becomes unique, different every day. Listening to his voice every day. Following his voice. Following his leading. There was an, um, one day I was driving home from church and I was driving. And the Lord said, turn off here. And it was a random off-ramp. And, and he said, take a right. So I did. I was like, where are we going, Lord? He's like, just, just hang on. There's a guy at a gas station with a black shirt on. And he has a broken arm. I want you to pray for his arm. Okay. Didn't see any gas stations or anything or whatever. But I took a right and then followed. And sure enough, there was a gas station. And as I parked, a guy in a black shirt was walking out the door. And I walk out, and he has a broken arm. And I prayed for him. I don't know if he was healed. After that, I just got back in my car and I started to head home, wondering if he was going to ask me to go somewhere else. I was very tired that night. I'm sure he healed his arm. I don't even know. He had a cast on. Couldn't really take that off. But I just knew he was going to be healed because the Lord told me where to go, when to go, and that there was everything he said was there when he said it was going to be there. So I knew he was going to heal them. You know? Of course he's going to heal them. He made everything else line up. That's what he came to do. And at the time, 
I um, wasn't at the point of asking people to come to the Lord and, and, and give their life to the Lord. I wasn't quite there yet. I knew I was supposed to and I was working to that. And after that, you know, to d- d- disciple the people. Oh, excuse me. I, I wasn't at that point yet, but ultimately that they would come to the Lord and you would disciple them would be ideal. And probably more. I'm just, that That's just where I'm at. But there's also a touch. Like, if they're hungry and they want to know the Lord and you they you introduce them and they give their life to the Lord and then they want more then that that's probably the person that you want to disciple because they're willing to learn and grow but someone that is a little standoffish doesn't give their life to the Lord well you can keep their number you know but but they might need more time. They might just be watering the seed. You know. Oh, I'm sorry. And, um. Getting tired, obviously. And there might be people that want to give their life to the Lord, but they're not quite ready. Maybe you get their number, but they're not quite ready to be discipled yet. And that's okay. You don't want to disciple someone that, that's not ready to be discipled and doesn't want to do it themselves and isn't into the Lord isn't going to say, oh, yes, I'll do it just to make you feel good because you're a random stranger and they're a people pleaser. No, no. You want you want to disciple somebody that wants to be discipled, right? And desires to know the Lord on their own accord, not because of anything you said or who you are, that they want to please you or whatever, whatever. It's that they genuinely want him simply because of who he is. Anyways. Um, something I saw was very interesting while reading this book. Yeah. There's a scripture in Isaiah 59, 19. It says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit, there's like, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. When you read that familiar verse, you come to the conclusion that the enemy comes in like a flood because it says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, comma, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. But I've got news for you. The flood is the Holy Ghost, not the devil. You see, in the Hebrew... There are no commas. That comma's taken out. But the King James translator put a comma there after the word flood and made the enemy more powerful than he actually is. The actual Hebrew says that when the enemy comes in, and then it says in quotations, like a flood, the spirit comes against him. It's so crazy, that little tiny comma, how that changes everything. Like a flood, the spirit comes in against him. The Holy Spirit is flooding against the, whole, the enemy. That's what I'm talking about. I thought that was very, very interesting. That made me so inspired and a little frustrated at the translators, honestly, because they made God seem smaller and... um that was annoying. You know, I just don't, I don't appreciate that kind of translating where they're almost like taking into their own hands what they think and their level of faith and giving that level of faith to the rest of the world, which is so, yeah, crazy. I thought this was very interesting. Okay, I wanted to read this. Of who the Father, God the Father is. 
I'm just going to read a little bit here because I really thought this was really inspiring to me. God the Father, what about the way God frequently appears to man? When Ezekiel had a vision of God in 593 BC, he described God, him seated above an expanse that separated creatures from the glory of the Lord. He saw the likeness of a throne in appearance like a sapphire stone with the appearance of a man high above it, Ezekiel 1.26. What was the appearance of God the Father? Like that of a man. You say, I've been taught that God is spirit. Yes, but he's a spirit with mysterious form, not some cloud floating in space. The Apostle John in Revelation described him as the reflection, reflected brilliance of precious stones. In scriptures, it talks about on his breastplate, on his bosom, there's all these stones and one that's of his, an opal, like a multicolored opal. And then there's lots of different stones, but that's because that's on his breastplate. He said, immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like Jasper and sardius stone in appearance i looked up sardius i think it's red and jasper's pink or i mean pink green like sapphire no no sorry sapphire's blue jasper's like deep deep green forest green and sardius i think is red i looked it up earlier when i was actually reading this revelation 4 2 and 3 the prophets describe the features of God in great detail. Isaiah says his lips are full of indignation. I looked up indignation as well, and it's kind of like frustrated, which is interesting. His tongue is like a devouring fire. His breath is like an overflowing stream. It's so interesting how they relate God to his creation like the way he is is also the what he's created is also in him in a way it's so interesting in a way you know we are in him and he's in us so maybe it's like that in other parts of his creation I don't know an overlay an overflowing stream Isaiah 30 27 and 28 and God revealed the fact that he can see they did evil before my eyes, Isaiah 66, 4. Hmm. To my amazement, I found that God is described as having the likeness of fingers and hands and a face. After the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the tablets of stone written with the finger of God, Exodus 31. Then the Lord said to Moses, you cannot see my face for no man shall see me and live. Exodus thirty three twenty, even he even talked to Moses about his back. That this was very interesting. He said, "While my glory passes by, I will cover you with my hand, while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen." Exodus thirty three, verse twenty two and twenty three. If God reveals Himself. As only invisible spirit. How was it possible that Adam and Eve heard his footsteps? That's a good point. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden of the cool of the day in Genesis 3 8. God also has a heart. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Genesis 6 6. So interesting. All that to say, I just wanted to share that a little bit with you, um, just because it brings God, God the Father, into a little bit more perspective. I think a lot of times God the Father is so unfamiliar in a way, because it feels like he's so mighty and so holy and so good and so far removed from this evil, evil earth that is meant to for heaven to come down and be heaven on earth. It just feels so far removed. And to make him all these verses put together in this compilation to, to, to see who God is 
to see a reflection of who he is. Ooh, I'm going to cry. Ooh, I can't cry. I can't finish my podcast if I cry. Um, Makes my heart ache to know him. And it's just simple things like his back, his eyes. His tongue is like a devouring fire. I don't know. I don't know why, but it makes him like Jesus, you know? I don't know. Anyways. Let's see. Um... Um, there's this one part... I'm going to maybe, um, yeah, start to close. So, I think I wanted to mention that when you're filled with the Spirit, there's this emboldenment that comes over you. Um... When I went to Bible school, we were constantly being in, like filled with the Spirit, filled with God's Word, filled with fearlessness, like filled with God and all fear. We're just knowing that how loved you are and how um, all the things of God that we were learning, it's as if fear was out the door. There was no one that I feared. There was no reaction to what I had to say about Jesus that I feared. And even if there was some crazy interaction, I relished in it because I knew God was at work and the devil was angry, right? So, so God is going to win. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what people think or say or do because God is, is on my side. God, God's grace is on my side to preach the gospel, to share the good news. To give away what I've been given. For people to be healed and set free from the chains and the burdens that they carry. He's on my side. I'm on his side, I should say. So anyways, I wanted to read a little bit about Peter. Because the, the, the words that he says shook me. There's two things that he says throughout Acts. And I wanted to read them to you. Peter was so filled of the spirit in the temple that he had, he had authority over his critics. Undaunted, he said, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified whom God raised from the dead by him this man stands here before you whole Acts 4 8 through 10 and in in the story before that was that Peter I think it's Peter and John um prayed for this guy that was couldn't walk from birth and um they prayed for him they said get up and he he could walk he was lame i think lame i don't know he couldn't walk and they prayed for him and he's healed and he walked into the temple and the and the leaders were like what the heck who did this what happened how did this happen um and so then peter was addressing these priests And people that had just killed Jesus. Um, Whom you crucified. Can you imagine? I want to keep reading. Do you realize that the power of the Spirit can so infill you that you fear absolutely no one? It's possible to establish such a communion with him that even addressing the leader of a nation would cause no apprehension. The Spirit will lift your head square on your shoulders and instill you... An unexpected confidence. One more, one more 
thing here. Peter was faced more than the priest of the temple. He was actually up against the government of Israel. In fact, the night before he was permitted to address the priest, he and John were thrown in jail. But when he spoke, the words were hard-hitting. He told them the Lord was the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Acts 4.11 It was a direct quotation from Psalms 118.22 This was the same Peter who a few weeks before, in the same place, before the same people, had been cowed by the sneer of a girl and had denied his master. Oh, it said, was this the same Peter who a few weeks before, in the same place, before the same people, had cowed by the sneer of a girl and had denied his master? Now, here, he was filled with the Spirit, an utter fearlessness, defying the murderers of Jesus. I think when I read that, I was like, oh my gosh, they were murderers of Jesus. Now, here he was, filled with the Spirit, in utter fearlessness, in front of the same exact people that he cowered at just days before, weeks before defying the murders of Jesus and was in potentially the same position to be crucified as he was or he feared the day Jesus was crucified. I mean, why wouldn't they just crucify him along with Jesus if he said he was with him? I don't know. Maybe that's why he was whatever. It was no longer Peter the meek. It was Peter the mighty. What a chance. What a change the spirit made. Hmm. <sighs> so intense. Um. Yeah. So. All that to say. Sorry, I was getting really worked up there because the Lord was doing stuff, moving. Um. I just wanted to share a little bit about the things I've been learning about Holy Spirit, about God the Father and all these things. Mostly about Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit. And um, I just wanted to share them with you and hopefully inspire you to get to know Holy Spirit. And, and put him in his right place in your heart as he is God. Yes, okay, you roll your eyes, you know he's God. But he is to be worshipped and glorified as much as God the Father and as God the Son. And I think that's really important. So, and also I wanted to encourage you to build your relationship with the Holy Spirit. And if anything, that you would be inspired to know Him more. Not inspired, that you would grow desire. Obviously, He gives the desire but that this would grow, that he would be giving you desire for him through this podcast in Jesus' name. To know him more. To love him more. In Jesus' name. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. for listening to this week's podcast it was my pleasure please subscribe and leave a review it means so much and share this with a friend thanks for listening love you bye-bye